speaker is Professor Rachel Balby. She's a professor of comparative literature at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at University College London. Her work looks at the diverse history uh, and practices of consumer culture, most recently in a book, Back to the Shops, The High Street in History and the Future. Uh, she has other shopping books, uh, one titled Just Looking, which is a book on novels about department stores, and another book which is uh, titled Carried Away, which is about supermarkets. Professor Balbi has also written on stories of parenthood, Greek tragedy, psychoanalysis, and feminist criticism. Rachel, please. Thank you so much, Claudia, and thank you so much for inviting me here, and it's been great to be able to come amid all of the difficulties that, that you're all experiencing. And um, I also want to begin with a word about, um, not difficult women exactly, but beautiful women perhaps, because I want to talk about this being a beautiful book. <laughs> so um, that's where I'm going to start and to, to con continue from, from what's just been said. And hello to Erica as well, from my part. So the first thing to say about the rise of mass advertising is also the first thing that will strike any reader of whatever kind whether someone who, like me and the rest of us speaking today, have been studying every page, or whether who, someone who, let's hope, may pick it up in a bookstore, or see it online, or on a screen, indeed. The first thing, then, that strikes you is that this book is a thing of beauty. It's full of extraordinary images. It's heavy, because it has glossy paper of finest quality. And I've brought the thing next up, so I will just do this in a, in a very demonstrative way. And <laughs> well, you can't see the images, it's, it's not stopping on the images, but it, it is, almost there you are, almost every page is <coughs> beautiful images and beautifully produced, I would say. Um, much care and much time and attention have been lavished upon its production as a visually and tangibly attractive object. All this is quite apart from the attention devoted to the composition of its many words, the research behind them, and the sophistication of their arguments. Among the many and diverse excellent features of the book, we should congratulate both Anat and her publisher on an aesthetic achievement. The book's a delightful object, and one that attracts attention as such. But there's also, of course, an irony in this beauty, or rather, to use a term that's like the light motif of the book, there's an irony in this enchantment. Drawing on Weber's famous formulation, an apt analysis of the early British history of mass market advertising takes as its starting point the question of advertising's alleged enchantments. The anomalous status of advertising in relation to the putative rationality of a steady, neutral modernity. From another point of view, however, this book would seem to be far away from the supposed enchantments of mass publicity. The book is long-term, whereas ad advertisements are almost by definition ephemeral. Both metaphorically and physically, the book is heavy, a quality product made to last, where ads are lightweight and pragmatic, here today and thrown away tomorrow. The book is specialised and academic, whereas ads the title says it all, The Rise of Mass Advertising, are for the masses. It's high culture, and it adds uh, not just low culture, but almost a personification of low culture. It has depth, where ads are superficial. The list and the expected contrasts goes on. But if the book is a non-ad, set at a distance from the easy charms of advertising, it's also exactly the opposite. It's full of advertisements. Ads galore, that's what its many pictures replicate. Um, beautiful, glossy reproductions on almost every page. But then you must ask, are they really ads in the operative sense of the word? These 19th century images are present in the book in the role of permanent exhibits, to be studied and perhaps admired, rather than to be acted on. No one will now be persuaded by them. That's not why they're there. 
or if they are persuaded, they're surely in the wrong century. <laughs> Instead, contemporary readers will appreciate them for what now looks like their bygone naivety or crudeness, or whatever it may be. That's the retro effect already beginning in the period that Anat describes, when, as she documents, eager spectators began to collect and preserve the ephemeral and ubiquitous posters before they were destroyed or pasted over. From being no more or less than an indication of the moment, the now, of the ever-changing Baudelairean modernity, an ad could thereby be transformed into history, acquiring its own distinctive aesthetic aura as an image of present time now become the past. Goalia suggested that we begin our talks by identifying a question within our own field of research that shows up usefully or differently through Anat's book. So for me, coming out of literary studies, sort of, one such issue is that of popular versus serious is literature, um, a putative category division which, like that of mass advertising, arose in the 19th century and is part of the same phenomenon. Many novels, which are regarded as classics today, began in life as serialised and seemingly short-term publications in the pages of daily newspapers. They were subsequently published as books, physical books, and some of those that survived into 20th and 21st century editions now figure as consecrated texts, with their low-key beginnings now forgotten or irrelevant to their current high status. For literature written in English, Charles Dickens is the outstanding example here. Um, his books began in, in serialised newspaper form. He's now perhaps second only to Shakespeare in the, in the canon of English literature. Yet the words on the page of his novels are exactly the same as those that appeared in the first ephemeral form, just as those beautiful images in Anat's book are identical to those that once graced or blotted the pages and walls and hoardings of their original Victorian settings. We can understand how a few best-selling book titles of the Victorian period have changed into enduring and often reprinted classics, as if by a process of gradual, if not natural, selection. But examples from Anat's book show us a parallel but different process occurring for posters and other advertising ephemera. Some posters are kept are deliberately preserved, and through that keeping, with its changes of situation, they then acquire a rarity and a value, irrespective of any real aesthetic worth that they may or may not have. They're now separated from the mass of similar objects with which they began, and it's that contingency, not any inherent qualities that are attributed to them, which gives them their, gives them their later significance as survivals. That's one layer or stratum to the framing of the advertisements in Anat's book. It involves a pivot from low to high status in cultural valuation. But arguments that relate to the distinction between high and low culture have had their own history of prominence or decline. They peaked, you could say, in the middle decades of the 20th century, in part through the influential works of the Frankfurt School but also with widely read, less theoretical, Anglo-American cries of cultural distress against all things mass, that bad word of the time. Anat's book is attuned to these contexts, and the title she chose both echoes and continues the historical perspectives that were inaugurated in those mid 20 <coughs> times. Semantically, the rise of mass advertising, the phrase itself, belongs to the 20th century even as it points to a backstory that's located in the 19th. By the same token, we find ourselves still in the book as if in a 20th century conceptual world of rises and falls, beginnings and middles and ends. And this brings me to the second related strand of what I'm going to say. Um, mass advertising in its time, as phenomenon and as an idea, appeared as relatively new, but foreseeably permanent. It was an aspect of a world-dominating system, otherwise known as capitalism, and it was either going to be revolutioned away into something utterly different, or it was more or less there to stay. This is not a place to go into the details of Marxist and liberal arguments uh, during what's now an earlier time to our own. 
But in the digital era of the 21st century, the scope and aims of advertising have changed. A campaign, note the military metaphor of that word, such an everyday word, no longer needs to be armed with weapons of mass, persu mass persuasion aimed at an equally large-scale target for women, all those in social class CD or whatever it might be. Instead, individual the, individual con the individual consumer can receive on their personal devices ads that are personal to their own profile, including their ad viewing profile, according to the platforms where they're already to be found. Targeting has shifted from the massive to the individual. From one angle, and paradoxically, this represents a revival of the place where modern advertising began with the classified um, newspaper advertisement addressed by one individual to another whom they hope that their ad will find. Offering situations vacant, jobs, um, or some particular object for sale. And that lovingly cites the example of Jane Eyre in Charlotte Bronte's novel, herself advertising for a governor's position. Um, Jane Eyre in the novel pays for a line or two to be placed in a newspaper and she gets more than she bargained for, a rather complicated man, as well as the job. Historically, the classified ad, straightforward and simple, is represented as the antithesis to the big flamboyant advertisement of the poster or the magazine page designed to attract the attention of anyone and everyone. The classified ad is small scale and situated in a column where it would be seen by someone already looking for such an announcement. The classified ad, then, is sober and practical rather than over-persuasive. It is informative rather than distracting. It's there to bring about con contact between a seller and a buyer who each wants to find the other. The buyer is looking for the object according to the classification of the ads, whether rooms for rent or chimney sweeping services. Classified ads today have many di digital manifestations, such as dating websites or rooms for, rooms for rent, um, when both parties, the seller and the prospective buyer, are looking to find one another. But the individually tailored advertising that appears on website portals is more one-sided. The consumer has no choice in what's put there in front of them, even though it's their past activity and consequent profile which has, in one sense, determined it. Such ads are personal to the point of direct interpolation that borders on the uncanny. Hi Rachel, we thought you'd be interested in, right after you've just been Googling some product or other, in what you naively thought was the privacy of your own time and place. Crucially, in the context of Anat's book, the ad, received, the ad received will be one that seeks to solicit and attract attention away from whatever task or pursuit the consumer is otherwise engaged in on their screen. A classified one-on-one -on -one ad, by contrast, may well have no enhancement, no would-be enchantment at all. So coming full circle back to a version of pre-mass classified newspaper listing, the new modalities of the one-on-one -on -one advertisement now have the effect of putting mass advertising into the shade. In the 20th century, all dominant and ubiquitous, mass advertising looked as if it would last forever. Today, it appears as having been only one phase, the 20th century moment, in, in a long history of public informational announcement and persuasion, which is my considered and etymological gloss on the word advertising. Um, I'd like to add, uh, uh, to end with a, que a question about language. One of the oldest and most obvious points of contention around the legislative control of advertising is its hypothetical truth or falsity. Can the claim in the ad be justified? Is it evidence-based? The factually false can be called out, potentially, but advertising, such is its enchantment, typically works in ambiguous ways that may make it difficult to adjudicate its claim to be stating a fact. Therein lies the difficulty for the would-be regulator, 
um, and therein lies much of the matter of Anand's book. One of Anand's most memorable case studies in this regard is that of supposedly pregnancy-ending pills. In other words, um, using the nasty but technical term, abortifacient tablets, supposed to do that which it was illegal to do to cause a miscarriage. The double bind here was that if they worked, they were doing something against the law, and their ads were advertising an illegal product. If they didn't work, then they were not doing what they were purchased to do, but there was no possibility of comeback or protest since that purpose was clearly against the law. Advertising for such pills avoided liability through a cloudy lack of specificity in the product description. It would obviously make no sense to announce the sale of a patently prohibited product. Instead, a coded language referred vaguely to blockages or irregularities and promised to relieve them. And that brings out the strength of the coded language here, understood by all concerned, but not open to condemnation on legal or linguistic grounds, precisely because there were no specifically incriminating terms. But it's not so clear what, at the time, the late 19th century time, could have constituted, could have constituted a factual statement of the situation the pill was supposed to put right. Our own 21st century culture refers to pregnancy and its termination with terms that in their own way are coded as scientifically neutral. Legal and ethical arguments relate to the age of the fetus at the time of its removal from the uterus. No 19th century woman would have had or used such vocabulary, such a conceptual framework. It was not available to her, not part of the culture. Um, but in any case, the words or the understandings that were or might have been used for this delicate predicament are not even fully known since, as with all matters close to bodily and especially to sexual experience, such understandings have left few written records. They can only be guessed at. Given that there was no visual picture of the contents of a womb, no scanning or fetal imaging as we say it and see it today, then the view of those first weeks may well have been very different, more to do with a vague wondering about an eventual baby um, than, than with a life already established and taking its course, or an ongoing pregnancy, as we might say. Um, there was no scientifically accurate test of early pregnancy either, let alone the over-the-counter kits that have been available since the later part of the 20th century. There were only missed periods, irregularity at first, of a necessarily indeterminate nature. The advertising descriptions, therefore, may not have been so far from the everyday ways of thinking about this situation of what we would now refer to as the first trimester of a pregnancy, whether dreaded or hoped for. And as Anat's book shows repeatedly, there's a broader issue here, which this extreme example shows up. Arguments about truth claims in advertising depend on a clear-cut notion of what counts as fact, as a neutral and unembellished description of a product and its use. But as with the changing descriptions and understandings of early pregnancy, the factual is itself a variable, even an ideological con construct having its own powers of persuasion. In that context, the consumer may well be someone who likes to imagine themselves as not swayed by emotional factors, but interested only in the information stripped bare of any enhancement. Consider, for instance, the delightful um, American discussions in the 1920s of effective advertisements for cars, able to appeal to those who regard themselves as impermeable to, in Anat's term, in, in terms, enchantment. Show the glamorous image by all means, the big new beautiful automobile and perhaps the attractive female to take for a drive, but also provide all the down-to-earth specs and stats, the practical features, the reasonable price, the gas consumption in miles per gallon. That way, the prospective purchaser can imagine that he's making a choice on rational grounds. He can ignore or deny 
um, the influence of the emotional forms of persuasion in the image that surrounds the realistic factual information. Already in the 1920s, this dual mode of advertisement is theorized in just this way, and by reference to two distinct types of consumer, the romantic, happy to see himself as seduced, and the classical, who likes to think of himself as making a sensible, thought-through choice. Versions of just the same game continue to be played in the advertising today, not least with the marketing that highlights the environmentally beneficial, or at least not harmful, characteristics of a car or other, other product that's also at the same time being sold in relation to clearly non-rational, magical criteria. What's the answer and what's the future? And that's what gives us a wealth of material for thinking further about the regulatory questions whose concrete institutional beginnings it lays out with such dedication and clarity and beauty. Everyone should read it. Everyone should also enjoy it. And as Anat does, um, ponder and analyze the enchantments by which we continue to live in our 21st century world.